why, in a place touched by heaven, evil is being cast out. I'd really like to shed this monster off my back, off my heart, <clears throat> off my spirit. Terry Arlick was sexually abused. In this corner of Canada, his and other claims for compensation ascending the Anglican Church broke. But that's the cost of, uh, of uh, when people sexually abuse people. It destroys lives. And, uh, and now um, the sins of the fathers unto the third and fourth generation. We're now paying the cost of something that happened a long time ago. This is the town of Lytton, British Columbia. It's a postage stamp of a place, population 2,000. 1,600 of them are native Indians, living mainly on reserves around the town. Small it might be, but Little Lytton is exacting a major, major price for events which occurred here 30 and more years ago. There hasn't been one household, one family that has been spared. Every single person has been affected by, by residential school. This is a gathering place for our people. Ruby Dunstan has heard all the stories. She's a former chief of Lytton's Indian community. She, like most here, was taken from her family to the now notorious St George's Residential School. St George's was one of 130 schools run by the Anglican and other churches around the country. Native Indian kids were forced to board at the school even though home might be just around the corner. Assimilation was the government policy of the time, the church a willing agent. I got rebellious, you know, because I'd be just sitting in church for two and a half hours, bored stiff, because who's, who's God? You know, I knew him as the creator. That's how I was brought up. When they talk about God, I had no idea who they were talking about. The St George's Residential School at Lytton is gone, burnt down years ago. All that remains is a boarded up chapel, and for the native Indians, memories of a catastrophic clash of cultures. It's a long time since anyone set foot inside this church. And here in the vestry, a pretty clear sign of what some locals think of the Anglican Church. And who could blame them? Because right next door to this chapel, some unspeakable acts took place. The dormitory supervisor, Derek Clark, was meant to be looking after the welfare of the kids under his charge. But instead, he was sexually abusing them. He would say, don't tell, don't tell anybody, this is just between us. And then he would uh, give me some fudge candy or any other candies that he would have in a room with him. <clears throat> He'd have the TV on loud enough where, you know, nobody could hear what was going on. <clears throat> Did you feel confused by that? Lost. Um, hurt, um, because it hurt while, while he was abusing me and scared, scared. I was, every time I was in that room, I'd cry into that pillow there and he just, you know. Terry Alec was nine when the abuse started. Or... It lasted till he was 14. At this healing gathering of Lytton's native Indians, Terry Arlick is the custodian of a sacred tradition, using scented smoke to cleanse the body and the soul. A lot of it is keeping up appearances, because Terry Arlick well remembers how Derek Clark abused him, and the day it all came out in a counselling session, with a stick and a punching bag. I had so much rage, so much anger, so much pain, A lot of hurt. I didn't realize, you know, that it hurt me that bad, that much, and that it, uh, that that sexual abuse controlled my whole life and my 
relationships that I had <clears throat> and I just beat that bag until I couldn't walk. The man who abused Terry Alec had sullied the souls of innocents. And in 1993, dormitory supervisor Derek Clark was convicted of serial sex offences. Two years ago, one of Terry Alec's best mates, Floyd Mowat, applied for compensation. The judge found that though Derek Clark was paid by the government, which funded the school, he answered to the church which administered the school. The judgment found that the church was guilty of a cover-up. We were found 60% liable, the, the government 40% liable, and we not then knew that the, well, the, the huge number of cases across the Canadian church uh, that, we, that we will not be able to survive uh, as a national church and some dioceses would not be able to survive simply because um, of the facts. The facts are abuse took place. The fact, uh, we were 60% liable. Fact, the damages are more than our assets. And so that means you can't exist and you have to start again. So the diocese is kind of like a circle through different mountain valleys. Later this year, history will be made. The bishop's vast diocese, the Diocese of Caribou, will pay the ultimate price for the past. It will cease to exist. Caribou and the other Anglican dioceses operate as separate legal entities, so the debts of one aren't covered by the others. The Mowat case cost Caribou a quarter of a million dollars in legal fees alone and there are at least another eight cases to come. Uh, we're financially exhausted, we're exhausted in all kinds of other ways. We've, we're beyond grieving. We, we're beyond grieving losing our assets. Sunday morning, St Paul's Anglican Cathedral in Kamloops, Diocese of Caribou. Here, the cost of paying for the past threatens the sacred traditions of others. This church, like the rest in the diocese, is slated to go in any fire sale. But the church's words of regret and its cries of poverty are scorned in Lytton. I don't believe that the Anglican church is going broke. Um, our people say when they hear that, that the church is going broke, they say, well, why don't they melt all the candlesticks, those golden candlestick holders or whatever you call them and, and all the collection plates. Why don't they melt that? Ruby Dunstan might be right. The Anglicans have legal advice which says they can't sell their churches because they are held in sacred trust. It will take a court case to sort out who really owns them. But can you see why the Ruby Dunstans of the world would be pretty cynical about oh, uh, the church. Absolutely, and, and I, I, I totally understand that because people believe that we, uh, ha we're hiding our assets. There's part of me that would just like to just say, take it all, but I can't, I mean, you can't give away things that don't belong to you. And, and the legal advice we have is that we hold it in trust. When people, when people give money to a charitable organization for a particular cause, it has to be used for the cause for which it is given. But there's more trouble ahead. More compensation claims are emerging, snaking their way across the country. Two more dioceses are headed the way of Caribou over separate sex abuse claims. Class action lawyers have lodged claims for physical abuse, emotional abuse and for so-called cultural abuse. There are 700 so far, all ending up at the doorstep of Canada's Anglican primate, Archbishop Michael Piers. The Archbishop prepares for the Anglican General Synod, knowing it may be the last. The Church's national governing body, too, has been bitten by compensation claims and says it will be bankrupt inside 12 months. Because I, I take the very long view of things, um, I live at a certain moment in the life of the world and the Church and my moment uh, will pass. And um, what I want is that it will be seen to have been a moment that contributed to healing, both in the church, but also in Canada as a country. Adored inside this arena, there are some outside who see the primate not as a visionary, 
but blind to reality. Eight years ago, as details of the abuse at residential schools emerged, he offered Native Indians an unreserved and unprecedented apology. I am sorry more than I can say that in our schools so many were abused physically, sexually, culturally, and emotionally. For 10 minutes, the primate detailed what he called the shame and humiliation of the church. And from the Anglican Church of Canada, I offer my apology. Well, presumably there are some who think that you're the captain taking the ship to the bottom of the harbour. I think uh, there are some who feel that way, and I think uh, a lot of that arises from some, um, some ideas about uh, the perils of apologising, which have turned out, in fact, uh, not to be the case, at least not legally the case. Their apologies, not just the primates. One Anglican who certainly does feel that is Ian Hunter. I mean, I, I often say that seldom do a group of bishops meet together without an apology issuing forth over this. Mr. Hunter is Emeritus Professor of Law at the University of Western Ontario. He's an Anglican, and his church is part of a diocese which is the subject of a $2.4 billion class action. Is it your view that this apology has made the church's position in court untenable? Yes completely untenable. I've often said that, I mean, if, if I were counsel for the plaintiffs in any of these lawsuits, I wouldn't bother calling any of the alleged victims. I'd simply call the primate, Michael Pierce, and uh, ask him, did you make such and such a statement on uh, September 1993, comparing it to the dropping of the atomic bomb on Hiroshima? Yes, I did. Uh, have you since said uh, that it's the worst tragedy, cultural genocide? Yes, I did. What other witnesses do you need? Was there no fear that the words of that apology might then be turned back against you, that it might form the basis of an irresistible tide of compensation. At the time the decision was made um, to apologise, that the council made the decision to apologise, um, this was, uh, this certainly was a, a consideration. Um, what we felt then was that we didn't know what the implications of that were. What we've learned since is that in legal terms there, uh, there is no implication uh, in terms of compensation. Uh, we didn't know that at the time, but when you know it's the right thing to do, um, you take that uh, path. The legal power of the Anglican Church's extraordinary apology has been tested only once. That was in the case of Floyd Mowat, who was sexually abused at St George's Residential School in Lytton. In that case, the judge made no mention of the apology in deciding against the church. The national debate was settled three years ago, when the federal government issued its own less detailed apology. Canada's Deputy Prime Minister, Herb Gray, is responsible for the government's response to the residential schools issue. Isn't it true that if you apologise, as you've done, it's an admission of guilt? You're saying... No, I service. don't say that. Uh, I don't agree with that. Uh, we feel that uh, this was the morally right thing to do. Uh, we don't see it being linked with any uh, findings of the courts uh, with respect to liability and... Uh, so the evidence is that a generalised apology does not prove an individual case. But there's now a flood of claims, and Herb Gray must try to break the legal logjam between the government, the church and complainants. Uh, there are over 4,000 uh, individual cases. They're growing at the rate of 140 a month. Uh, if we don't take some action to uh, resolve the matter, it could take 20, 24 years to have them work their way through the courts. For the Anglican Church, the court cases raise the risk of financial apocalypse. 
some of the church's social programs have already been cut. The Synod's Toronto headquarters is set to be sold soon, and they're demanding that the federal government come up with an overall settlement package to take the courts out of the equation. It's not compensation that we're opposed to. Compensation is where we would like to be. Litigation is where we are at 98% of our costs. In most cases before the courts, it's the federal government being sued. But the government has taken out cross claims against the church which ran the schools. As a result, there's an almighty battle between church and state. There is also another face of government, which is the Department of Justice, whose mandate is um, to protect the government against all comers. And that means Aboriginal people, it means churches, it means anybody. And to pursue an aggressive policy which says, we're not sitting there waiting for you to come to us, we're coming to you. And uh, we're taking you on. Well, the, the issue is uh, what's fair uh, to all concerned, including the claimants who feel that uh, there is a responsibility uh, of uh, church organizations and their former employees, and the uh, view of Canadians who may feel that uh, if there's a shared responsibility, uh, that should be recognized in any overall settlement, and that's what we're discussing. We see Herb Gray says, look, we, we have to take a long time to get this right. We have to talk to the native people, that all the churches, all the people. So give us time. Do you buy that argument? Well, that's, a, that's the opinion of an institution which has two things in its favor, a lot of money and a lot of time. Uh, I uh, um, work in an institution which doesn't have a lot of money and certainly doesn't have a lot of time. As a friend, as a leader, as a brother, so I extend my hand In the Anglican Church's version of reality, there will one day be full reconciliation with native Indians hurt by the residential schools. Some have stayed with the church and forgiven it. Others, though, never will, despite the hugs and despite the biggest apology in the world. Because how can I forgive when I can't forget what they did? Maybe on my deathbed I'll forgive, I don't know. I don't know that. But knowing the kind of person I am, I'll probably get to heaven and kick ass up there. <laughs> For the primate, there is some joy amid the pain. Having shown the moral courage to admit the truth, the church's immediate future is being dictated by the courts and politicians. But the Anglican primate is confident his institution will emerge the stronger for it. We really are in for the long haul. And on the long haul, a century from now, this will have been a difficult time, discreditable to the church in a number of ways, but not in every way. It has forced us to rise to some potential that we might not have thought existed within us around issues of, of um, he, apology and forgiveness, healing and reconciliation, so that our long future will be the best it can be given our checkered past and our perilous future. <laughs>